Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to English uh, Poetry. Today, we continue, after the midterm exams, our journey with the Romantic Poets. Uh, we are uh, already done with William Wordsworth, William Blake, and we discussed how this new movement in poetry, called, later called Romanticism, was in many ways a reaction to uh, uh, the neoclassical, the Augustan poetry or, that was dominant for, uh, for centuries. Everything with Romanticism was new in terms of uh, sensibility, in terms of what poetry is, and uh, in terms of definition of poetry, in terms of uh, the rules of decorum and how they, s they saw that these rules were not uh, fit anymore. In many ways, we said the Romantic poetry was a revolution in poetry, a revolution in, in words. And put in mind that this was the age of revolutions. We spoke about the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. Uh, in many ways, the, the poetry of the first generation of Romanticism, mainly uh, William, William Wordsworth, and also sometimes we can add William uh, Samuel Coleridge, can be described, can be, be criticized in many ways, that it was detached from reality. It was uh, basically uh, an escapist poetry. You just escape from the problems, the horrors of the city, of life, of politics, and run away to nature and enjoy yourself. You see the positive things. You see beauty amidst misery, amidst pain and suffering. And for this, again, those uh, poets, especially William Wordsworth. Again, I don't want to reduce William Wordsworth to this. I don't, again, I hate to describe those first generation poets as, you know, tree huggers. They just were, were purely dedicating everything to, to nature for the sake of that. Although sometimes we, we could feel this in daffodils. Uh, the second generation reacted to this. They even, uh, in, in many ways, mocked, criticized, and hated. Uh, things, at least things, uh, how things were done by uh, William Wordsworth. Uh, a, a poetry, a, a course in poetry is incomplete if we don't uh, see what Shelley uh, has done. Shelley can be considered by many people as a school of his own in many ways. He was a romantic, but he was also different from other, other romantic uh, poets. You need, uh, there is a poem, Anarchy, which he wrote about uh, a massacre that took place in, in Manchester. Look at how he is involved in the politics and in, in life. And I know many people would look at poets as people who are neutral. No. If you are neutral in the face of oppression and injustice, you are not paying attention. You're not a poet. A poet is someone, yes, someone who feels, who expresses himself or herself, but also a poet who reacts, not only reacts, but also promotes action and change and justice and freedom and human rights. Uh, you could read his other poem, uh, it's actually five sonnets, uh, Ode to the West Wind. In these poems, he directly and indirectly calls for revolution against oppression, against the political system, the political regime. So it's, it's a basic theme we have in his, in his poetry. Something, again, that is described by, by many as radical. Poets have more or less been close to the, you know, to the palace, to the court, in the Augustan age and before. You had to be close to somebody who was rich, to the, to the king, to the queen, to a prince. So, who, uh, so, so he, he, he could, or she, could protect you, give you money. And then later on here, we have poets who stayed away from the city as the den of corruption and sins. But then we have this man who says no. And I think it was uh, Shelley who said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. It's poets who start things. It's poets who call for things, who make people pay attention. If poetry doesn't do this, if poets don't do this, that's not going to be good poetry. And again, it was uh, Shelley who said, who criticized the time he was lived in as a, a, a time where the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. 
And if you describe any society, like basically you could describe any society nowadays, but we, we see this here very concrete in Gaza. How rich people, very few rich people, they're still getting richer despite the fact that the majority, the 99% of people are getting even poorer and poorer. So if there is poverty, pain and suffering, you will find people who benefit from this, who would love uh, to see this because this is something that makes them cash. Again, we will find some people who hate Chile. Uh, sometimes they say his port is very direct. The meaning is there, it's clear. There's nothing to unravel there. We'll see about that. Uh, today we have Ozymandias by Percy Bish Shelley. Uh, I want somebody to read this poem. It starts with, I met a traveler, please. I met a traveler from an antique land who said to vast and trunkless flakes of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand, half sun, a shattered visage, visage light, was a crown, and wrinkled lip and smear of cold from man, till that its sculptor, sculptor, sculptor will lose patience with. Which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, on, and on the pedestal bit, these words appear. My name is Cosimandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and disappear. Despair. Despair. Al although disappear could be a good word also. Go on. Nothing beside remains round the decay of the. Colossal break. Around the decay. Around that, uh, the decay of, the, of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. 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 The lone and level sands stre stretch far away. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Please. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and thankless lakes of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown, and wrinkled lip, and sneer of cold command, till that, that its sculptor will those passions read, which, red. Yet, red, which yet survived, stamped on these life, lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fit. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias. Ozymandias. Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing besides remain round the decay of the closer wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sand stretch far away. Very good. Please. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand have sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, you mighty and despair, nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare, the long and level sands stretch far thank, away. Thank you very much, very beautiful. So what do you make of this poem? What do you make of it? What, what do you think? How would you approach it? When you come to a poem, remember, we read it loudly because we need to get the sense, the tone, the atmosphere, to feel it. And then, and then what? It has a sense of drive. So you focus on the theme, basically. Okay. Remember, there are so many approaches to get to a poem, to understand a text. So you, some of you might, first and foremost, just look at the theme. So this is about pride. What about pride? Is, this, is the poet promoting pride? Or is he saying pride is good or pride is bad? Yeah. What is he saying about pride? Mm -hmm. That's too much, pride, too much pride, you know? Sorry. Hubris, right? You know the word, the term? Yes. Hubris. What else? Please. It's Oh, yeah. 
It's a short poem. When you count the lines, these are 14 lines. It's a sonnet. And then very quickly, we, we map this into, remember, yes. Petrarch, Shakespeare, Italian, and an English uh, sonnet. We'll come back to this in a, in a bit. But for 14 lines, again, remember, we, we, we saw this with William Wordsworth. He used the form of a sonnet. We, we, we'll see about, about this. What else? What else would you look at? The, what would you do with the text? Please. Okay, so you, you, you're trying to, like, do you mean by who's there that... Who's in the poem? Okay, the people, yeah. the characters there. Okay, so, it, like, like, are the characters more important than any other thing? Why would you start with characters in particular? Because the characters would decide on how, uh, on the way I would understand the poem. Okay, so we have, who's this I? The speaker. The speaker, the persona. The persona. And then there is? The traveler. The traveler. Okay, what else? Who else is there? Uh, maybe the, the, reader. the speak. Okay, the speaker, persona, and the traveler in the text. The characters in the text, the, directly mentioned in the text. Ozymandias. Please. Ozymandias. Thank you very much, Ozymandias. And thank you very much. The sculptor. Where's the sculptor? Where's? Okay. So who's speaking here, basically? The persona. Okay, the persona is telling us this, but again. That traveler said much, oh, like it's basically, if this man is quoting the traveler verbatim, word for word, it means the poet, the persona, only says just uh, one line, two words. Because this, everything is quoted. But is everything here said by the traveler himself? No. Basically because we have, yeah, why? Why no? Some, some of you said no here. Okay, so there is another quote here. My name is Azimandias, king of kings. Look at on my works, ye mighty and despair. It's like a, you know, uh, the Russian dolls, the Pandora's box, where there is keep giving. There's something inside, something inside, something inside, something. It never ends. So it's narrative poetry, not lyrical. This one? Possible, but again, narrative poetry is usually long, very long. It tells stories like... Nice. So you would look at, would you look at the setting? Yes. Yeah, we can like, look at the setting and the time. The so place. the setting is the time and the place. Okay, what about that? Like, I'm from an antique land. Okay, an antique land. That's the place. It's a land described as <laughs> antique. Okay. What else? What other words modify? Yeah, Very good. The land is a desert. What else? Sand and this boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch. So just it's not just sand. It's like, a, it's like an endless. Endless everywhere. Sand, sand everywhere. And because this is Ozymandias or Ramses the second, we understand that this is in Egypt, right? The timing. Does it tell whether this is early morning, night, or day, or I don't know, yes. afternoon, after lunch? Does it tell the timing of the day? So basically this is what time of, you know? It's not shown. Not shown the timing, it's but the date, like? Yes, like something that is really old. Very old. This is very old, but the time that traveler saw this, it's probably something 18th century? 18th century? So Egypt, not Egypt now, but Egypt in the past. Nice, very good. What else would you look at? One of the things that attracted me most was the powerful language and the tone it gives to the poem. So how do you how do you get the tone of the text? It's, it's powerful. How how would you understand the, the tone? Where do you get that? Where is the tone in the poem? Right? How they just come out of the reader. But remember, you need to read it aloud so you feel it. Yes. With, is there one tone for, po for, for, for a poem? No. 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 
would two people read the same poem differently? Yes. yes. No. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Um, in, in terms of tone, yes. would you get the same tone all the time? No. Hmm? Mm. Like it's a, there is a rise in pride, then and, and that like then there's nothing. That the other, the other of the it's powerful and ironic at the same time. Okay, where's the irony? The irony is that he he says words as powerful as look on my works, you might be in despair, but the irony comes after that. So nothing beside remains. Mm. Decay. So you you say you're saying that look at there is there is a command here. Yeah. This is Zemandius. So He's so giving. He's giving a command to, to whom? No, to the mighty, to kings. He's even challenging powerful people, mighty people, powerful people. If mighty people, if kings would despair, like, oh my God, I can't have this. Imagine the poor, ordinary people, how, how would they be reacting? going to be not only despair, probably despair and disappear. <laughs> okay? So yeah, there is, but then because the twist here is that uh, uh, it's maybe, maybe it's not a twist actually because it doesn't come here in the opening lines. If this opens the, the, the sonnet, like uh, my name is Zemanias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty and this and then we are told that everything is, you know, the trunkless, the, uh, the sand, the despair, the half-shuttered uh, visage. It would come as a shock. But here he brings us, this is in the middle of nowhere. And that's beautiful here because he says here that uh, surrounding this here, boundless and bare. The sands stretch away around it. So it comes first, comes but yeah, there is, I think there is irony. One of the most powerful ironies you will ever see. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. This is a king, this is the king of kings, Shahin Shah, you know? He's not challenging, he's not commanding ordinary people because this comes by default. Ordinary people will be commanded, will be, you know, shaking. But he is challenging mighty people, powerful people. However, there's nothing there. It's just bare, round, the decay. So other things we could notice the fact that this is the first person. Uh, we usually focus on the narrative in, in stories, but it's usually good to see where the poet is positioning himself or herself. I met a traveler from an antique land. It's significant to highlight this. The land is described as antique, old, ancient. Degagadima. It was good in the past, it's no longer. Who said? Now, why the quotation marks? Is he telling us that I am honest 100% narrating things as told to me? And if this, what? What do we make of the ellipsis here? Is this, is he giving us the idea that somebody, that he's being very honest? He's telling us everything as is? Two vast and trunkless legs. The legs are trunkless. I like this, less. Legs of stone stand in the desert. The legs, the trunkless legs, are still there. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage. Face is half shattered. Half sunk and shattered, sorry. It's broken. Lies. Whose frown? Whose frown is this? The face. The face. The frown of the man, the king. Whose frown, you know a frown, like a king, 
it's not good for a king to look, you know, smiling, and people might take that lightly. It's just serious. And wrinkled lip. And sneer of cold comment. You could easily get this, the frown, the wrinkled lip. But the sneer of cold command, like you look at the face, you see nothing but a sneer of cold command. A powerful man, an authoritarian man, the king of kings giving commands and orders to people. And because he's the king of kings, there is a sneer of cold command. He's certain that people will obey, people will follow. But how easy is, is it for a sculptor to capture this? And how easy is it for us to read this? That's a challenge. Not an easy thing, because we, sometimes we say, about, did you see how he react? Or did you, did, did, did you see how, what she did you know, with her face? It's like, what? I didn't see anything. It's just natural. This is, this is her ordinary face. Why are you you're reading too much into this? Till that, so these things, till that the, scul it's a sculptor, the sculptor, you know, the man who created this, will those passions read, read those passions well, accurately, perfectly. This is a perfect reading. I like the word red here. Yes, it rhymes somewhere with fed, but the choice of word is significant. Look at the fronting. It should be uh, the sculptor read well those passions. The sneer, command, the wrinkled lip, the frown, these emotions, which yet survive. Now, these things survive, although the, the whole structure of the sculpture didn't survive, right? But these things are still there. Stamped on these lifeless things, another less, the hand that mocked. Whose hand? The king. No. Nope. Sculptor. Sculptor. Probably it could be someone else, but I don't think this is the, the, the hand of the king. Could be the hand of the poet. Could be the hand of nature. I don't know. Okay, Paul, but here, look at the, if you look at the grammar, the, 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 thing, the, the thing is that he's talking about the hand that mocking here is like doing the sculpture itself. Okay? Imitating, copying the facial expressions, you know, the, the sneer of cold command on the face of, of Ozymandias himself. So the hand that mocked, that imitated this, that did the sculpture, the hand that mocked them, the passions, and the heart that fed. I, I find it very interesting how we have more into the sculptor himself. The works, the works of Ozymandias are broken, shattered, half sunk, right? They're just scattered around the area, the place. But the work of the sculpture is immortal, is more immortal is there. Despite the fact that this is broken and half sunk, you can see the frown, the wrinkled lip, the sneer of cold command, which again the traveler says to the narrator, to our poet, that, of, oh, listen, and the traveler has not seen Ozymandias. The traveler does not know how Ozymandias looks. So how can he judge? How can he tell that these this is the perfect sculpture for Ozymandias. And on the pedestal, these words appear. And that's again, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, you mighty, and despair. Look at the commanding language, look. This is, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Ozymandias is the Western name for Ramses II. And even the name itself here is changed. It's not the name that the pharaohs themselves or the ancient Egyptians used for this man. 
again, look on my works. Okay, look, you could look. It's physically possible, but how? What does it mean when you order somebody to despair? What, like, does it mean give up? Like, give up any hope of being like me or beating me? He's certain, of course, he's, he's, he's the king of kings. He's more powerful. He's mightier than anybody around. So it's true that but again, despair, I find this very interesting. Like, give up would have been easier. Despair is something internal. But yeah, sometimes you look at somebody who has done, like, if you try to write poetry or short story, sometimes, like, you read somebody, your friend's poem, and then you give up. You say, like, oh, I'm never going to, to write something as good as this thing. Possibly, it's similar to this. And then again, we go back to the nothingness here. Nothing beside remains round the decay. Just decay of the colossal wreck. It's just a wreck, something shattered, destroyed. It's just remains, ruins of an ancient civilization, of an antique land. Boundless and bare. I like, I love like less. There is less, less and less. Three lessons. And bear the lone and level sands stretch far away. So before we talk in more detail about, about this poem, let's go back to the fact that this is a sonnet. Can somebody uh, do the rhyme scheme? Please. Okay. Land. Land is A, remember how we do things? The first sound, the rhyme scheme is the ending sound or sounds of a line of verse. Stone is B. Sand is another A. That's frown, not frown. So? B, why? Okay. Command. There's land and sand. So, A. Say what? Yeah. And then Red Sea. D. Fed uh, Sea again. Appear E. Kings? D. D. Are you sure? Okay. And? Despair? Despair appear. So this is imperfect. And then DK. F. Despair and bear. E. Appear. Bear. Appear and bear, they're not the same. Okay, and away. Whew. Anybody else? Anybody doesn't like this rhyme scheme? Can we say that there's no rhyme scheme? But do you have another opinion? Don't jump to conclusions. You will fall one day. Are you okay with frown being a B? Should it be another, should it be a C? Sorry? So you would go for a B small, imperfect, because the N is the same, but it's that O and OW, different sound. So there is A, B, a, B, A, C, and then, then D, C, E, D, E, F, E, F. So this could be cool. If this is C, D, C, D, that would have been something. What do you think? What do you make of this? It could be something else, of course. Here, so this is E, and then despair, and I think despair and bear are the same, yeah. but not appear. So this is 
F G F G. But say there's something here, there's a problem here with the rhyme scheme. C C D C E. We've never seen this. If if it is again A B A B C D C E and then E uh, F G F G. What do you make of this? What do you make of the form, the uh, the rhyme scheme first? But it doesn't alternate. Not, yeah, not all the time, but like we have like A, B, A, B, A, B, we have the imperfect triangle. So is this close to Shakespeare or? It's closer to For me, it feels like we're forcing a rhyme scheme to the poem. I think like there is no rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's a There's always a rhyme scheme. It is, but, but it's not a regular one. It's not a regular yeah, one. Like, yeah, there is no rhyme scheme. The fact that we have like um, I think two or three imperfect rhymes, and the fact that it doesn't flow with A, B, A, B. But remember, it's just uh, the, the rhyme scheme gives a tiny bit of the music, it's usually the rhythm yeah. there. But even with that, the rhythm doesn't flow like we've seen with Shakespeare. If you try to sing it, it's not going to flow like Shall I, Compare Thee to Summer's Day. So this could also be described as a formless sonnet, adding to another list to the trunkless, lifeless, lifeless boundless, formless, structureless. In many ways, the, the sonnet itself is shattered, is probably half sunk. I love how this is employed Remember with Wordsworth, he, here he is also employing the sonnet and changing the way he sees fit to mirror and reflect the theme. What's going on in the text? In the text, what do we have? We have ruins, we have remains. We have something that is imperfect, destroyed, half shuttered, half sunk, shuttered, half sunk. And in this, in this way, the form is very much connected with the content, the theme. He's giving us uh, a, an episode, uh, a glimpse of Egypt, of the Middle East, of Africa, how it's formless and lifeless and legless and structureless. And that's why the sonnet tries to, to echo this. Please. But he doesn't use Shakespeare, he doesn't use Petrarch. He doesn't do that. Can you ask something? Like, we consider this a sonnet. Like, can we consider like, not, not a sonnet? Not a sonnet. Yeah. But Basically, yeah. Because, remember, a sonnet, traditionally speaking, love poem, 14 lines, rhyming in a particular way, but it doesn't mean if somebody, we've seen with, with, William, uh, with uh, Joan Dunn, William Wordsworth, they changed the subject matter and more or less they uh, respected a particular form, a particular rhyme scheme. If you change the rhyme scheme, does that change the fact that this is a sonnet? But remember, this is a romantic poet. And a romantic poet, the first thing for romanticism was, again, to experiment, to change, to link the form. Remember, the form before was a given. You have this, this is the form, this is Shakespeare, this is Petrarch, and you do your experience, you limit, control your experience within a particular rhyme scheme. But this is a man who is refusing, rejecting this. We've seen this with, 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 uh, with John Donne, but he wasn't, uh, experimenting, he wasn't dismissing the rhyme scheme totally like, uh, uh, I think there is a rejection of authority, a rejection of Shakespeare's authority, a rejection even of Petrarch's authority here, saying no. And this could be linked to the theme itself, how the poem is, what the poem is doing to authority, like to power, to people in power. It's like the poem about the decay of Possibly. Like Authority in general. Please. If I remember well, there is actually a third form of the 
There are many forms. There's Spencer. It's different. I, I don't think it's the same. No, it's different. No. But we'll have to check that. Please. I think that we can call it a sonnet because with the number of the syllables in the, like the last 13 lines. The first one. The last? Lines, yes, 13 lines. The first one is just 11 and the, the rest are 10 lines. Okay. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And the rest Remember, when we have 11 syllables, it could go for 11 syllables. I have no problem with that. But it could be that one of the syllables, one of the schwas can be just removed. Traveler. I, what, what I figured out, like, uh, the first one, because the, the person is talking about himself, he saw, he met a traveler, he, it is 11. Then the, when the traveler started to, to talk, then it is uh, 10 syllables. So this is all 10. I didn't count this, but that could be something. So if we examine, so, so I like to do it this way. I like to see what the form and the shape, what they tell us. We can talk about that, of course, because it's connected with the formlessness of the sonnet. Let's move a step. We have, what do you think of the poem? Do you like it? Do you think this is a good poem? Quickly, just raise your hand. I'm not going to quiz you. Do you like the poem? Do you think it's a good poem? Do you think it's a nice poem? Or who doesn't like it? OK, 90% of you haven't raised their hands. So neutral, huh? OK, this is not black or white. Who doesn't like the poem? Just one, two, three, four. Who likes the poem? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, possibly. Neutral. Who's neutral? Me. Or you need time to, to reconsider. You need time to reconsider. Why? Why are you ambivalent? OK, you are still undecided. Take your time. Voting is tomorrow, so <laughs> you can still pick. What do you think of the persona? Just step by step, going back. What do you think of this, the persona, the I in the poem, please? I think that the whole poem is just a matter of irony. I don't know. This is my own perspective. Because I believe that there are many things that implies a, a hidden irony there. Like, for example, I wanted to talk about the imperfect trend, that he used the imperfect trend to describe that Yes, he is a demandus, and he's saying that I'm the king of kings. However, he's not actually saying it. It's written on his sculpture, so it's not. In, and even like it was not him who made this sculpture; it was the sculptor mm -hmm. himself. So the persona. The persona. Um, I think that the, the persona was kind of candid about it. I think that yes, he was telling the truth, especially with the whole love. Mm -hmm. So this is a persona that you believe you take seriously. Although, be careful, with the I, with the narrator being I, the first person narrator in stories, there's a lot of subjectivity there. Absolutely. And also, there is a lot of, you know, uh, you know uh, credibility issues we need to question here. We'll see about that. What do you think of the traveler? What do you think of the traveler? Do you have any, any idea? He said the story from his Traveler, yeah, please. The traveler is a sensible man. Yeah. Where is that in the text? Well, he isn't. It's like he's mocking the power of kings. That, that, that makes him a sensible man? Yeah. Okay. That he is sensible. He's, he's dealing with the things that he has seen. Okay. He's just, he, he's just honestly, he's a historian he's honestly right. describing this. That's very, he uses very concrete language. He's more of a poet than a historian. Yeah. And usually you have to be careful with poets, how they exaggerate, how they change things to fit their narrative sometimes. OK, so some people think he's sensible. Some people don't think he's sensible. Do you believe the, the traveler? Do you think he's credible? The, the whole poem could have been OK with, uh, uh, with the narrator himself here, the, uh, the persona saying, starting the poem in a different way without having to say, I met a traveler. But this adds uh, you know, more credibility to this. It could have the, po the poem could have started two vast 
you know, and trunkless legs of stone and that's it. But the fact that he's adding the traveler means that traveler is significant to the poem. Could add a level of credibility, it could make people think that this is historical. He's descriptive. Yes, he just described the boundaries. But he's giving his opinion about the reading here. The sculpture I is a perfect representation of Ozymandias. I said, aside from his opinion okay. about the, the So he, he's doubtful a little bit. You doubt him a little bit here, but you yeah, could. Probably, but, doubt but this is very descriptive. Also, I think, I think the trick that he played in the poem, the chain that he created, the one is someone has been told by a mother. Mm -hmm. by a mother yeah. So this is a man who's honest, somebody who's citing his resources, you know, documenting who said what. What do you think of the sculptor? Or the sculpture? What do you think of the sculptor? Yeah. Please. I think he's really talented, that after all those years, the, the expression the Pope command is still visible on a shattered face. So yeah, I think he's talented, even more talented than the king, because like his works is what remains, not the, the works of the Osmanians. Okay. Um, what do you think? Maybe the sculpture could be kind of like the poet himself, because when you talk about the sculpture, the, scu the sculpture itself, it remained after, like, I don't know, hundreds of years, and the same as it goes for the poem itself. Like, do you mean like this is uh, some kind of a, uh, an art, uh, a work of art? Exactly. And art survives Throughout literature, the poetry, sculpture? True, this is about how art survives, despite every, everything. So, what else, other than talented? What would you say about the, scu the sculptor, other than talented? Um, I want to say that he can be the, the, the mighty one, or he can be not the mighty. I want to say that he can be like the king of kings, uh, rather than Ozymandias, because he created the sculpture, not Ozymandias himself. And the sculpture so this is like when a, when a poet writes something to praise somebody, a king, or so, but the poem eventually is about himself, his own, work. his own work that is going to outlive and survive everything. Okay, what do you think of Ozymandias? Do you like him? I think he's a good guy. Do you hate him? Is he nice? Is he cool? Would you like to have him as a friend? Please. Maybe the commands that he um, he gave to the mighty people. Um, I mean, so, uh, people. I mean, uh, human beings doesn't want doesn't doesn't want, doesn't, want, doesn't want something someone to look to look at uh, on his work. Uh, maybe his uh, the works itself uh, it attract people to look on it, not people command. Uh -huh. give oh, commands right. okay. to look on the works. Okay. That, that, that's the same things I dislike on on uh, So. But I, okay, so the idea is that if this is great, people would be attracted without being commanded to look. And I, I think I don't agree with you saying that human beings don't like it when people look at their work or something. We do. Don't we post everything nowadays on social media? Aren't we all out there for people displaying every tiny little detail of our, of our lives? Them okay. To look at the I, I disagree with Hakim. Like in Quran, Allah says, "Look at Masana the Kamil and look at these and look at what I created." So when but the looking there is just to look and you know to meditate, to think how perfect this world yes, is. Yes, to be amazed, not to despair. But, but not to despair. To despair, yep. so despair to feel bad? To no. To feel bad. To feel afraid of the, the, the hereafter. But that's different from despairing, giving up. This is about giving up on life. I will never be like this. But yeah, so what does that mean about, what does that tell about Ozymandias himself? <coughs> Would you like him to be your, your ruler if he's no, the, the no, prime minister of Palestine, no. the president of Palestine? Would you like to have him? He's a he has an inferiority complex. Inferiority where? I don't see it. He's a 
bragging about his wealth. So he feels inferior, yeah. and that's why he's compensating all the buildings, all the huge, maybe you know, sculptures. Maybe you ignore, or ignore his words. So he, words he was a great king, this man. He was a great, great king. He, king of kings. Yeah. King of kings, like, probably, yeah, yeah. Like a god. So he has a, an inferiority complex. What else? Again, would you like to have this man as, I don't know, your teacher, your head of department, uh, your prime minister, your president, your friend? Yes or no? Why? Again, quickly. It's like the forcing shout on him, so you don't like you don't like the commanding tone. You want somebody who's more democratic. So this man is authoritarian, yeah? Yes. He's not democratic. He's not giving us the choice of looking. He's ordering us to look and to despair rather than feel proud about our country because of I don't know. But honestly, be honestly, isn't this like our, all our fathers? Yeah. When I was your age, I went to Mars. I ate the biggest pizza in the world. I swam across the Atlantic. I. I beat up the gods. This here was a mountain and then I made it into something. Don't our parents always brag about how they were a lot better than us when they were our age and that how they keep pushing us to treat, study, do. Don't. When I was your age, you know, we have this. It's always... Without explaining. But the purpose of our But sometimes you feel crap, like when he just gives, yeah. So this is a, an authoritarian figure, a dictator, right? You said a dictator. But at the same time, this is like a father figure that we could have in our lives. Giving us orders, giving us commands, telling us what to do and what not to do. But what sometimes we do. Just, oh, I'm not going to be like my, my, my dad or my mom. She makes the best cake. He's the best man in the world. Because we look up to our parents. Even if they are not good people, not good employees, not good teachers, not good, I don't know what they're doing. We always look up to them. If I want to look at it from a completely different point of view, like only these two lines. He can be talking about like the uh, Almighty. He can be addressing the uh, like other kings and telling them, like, look Thank you. I Thank you very much. That's a very that's a very interesting point here. Isn't this man probably challenging the occupiers, the invaders? So challenging them like, and, and this makes them makes him a man who's defending us, defending the country. So would you want him to be your prime minister? So some 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 people are changing their minds. Are you now undecided or? I'm not sure. But the traveler is mocking him. So how would you Who's traveling? Who's the traveler is mocking him? Yes. Who's doing the mocking? The sculptor. The sculptor. Or maybe the traveler is putting this into the into reading the the, the the sculpture itself. So because some people will will challenge this reading by the traveler. How could you know that this is a perfect accurate reading if this if this is shattered? If the visage itself, you know, if you look at somebody's face that is half or had shattered or half sunk, sometimes you can't tell whether they are happy or sad or, you know, because it's just half of their face, half of the truth is hidden, half of the, the face is hidden. I think. Okay, I agree with that. I totally agree. He even said that he 
you as God. He's so, king of kings. He's king of kings. Like, king of kings is God. He's, he's saying that I'm God. So do you like that? No, I would never want him for a ruler or a prime minister or whatever. Would you like, okay, would you like, if, if this is a man challenging, a leader challenging other invading powerful countries of his time, and at the same time he is internally, he's a bad ruler, he's a dict dictator, an authoritarian, but... Uh, globally or regionally, he's doing a good job defending you from invaders, from invasions. Would you still say, okay, 100% no. no? Would you rather have a very weak king or ruler, very weak one that doesn't defend you, that doesn't protect you, someone that doesn't do this and at the same time cool and, you know, swag? It's impossible, I think. I, I did this trick that maybe you didn't pay attention to when I asked these questions. I, these are stupid questions in many ways. But I wanted you to say, when you talk about the persona, you said he. When you talked about the, the traveler, you said he. When you talked about that sculptor, you also said he. So this is something we'll come to in, in, in a bit. Now, when we talk about a text, I'm not going to go more into the theories here. This is not a literary theory course, but I'll show you how sometimes a text there's a, there a critic called M. H. Abrams. Okay, so we go back to M. H. Abrams, who says there are four groups of uh, literary theories. Uh, the first one is uh, mimetic theories, uh, theories of imitation, mimesis, how literature is uh, the relationship, like how poetry is a reflection of the universe, okay? And then we have the uh, pragmatic. Is it the pragmatic or the didactic? The, 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 the poetry that examines the relationship between the text and, and the audience. Where poetry here is basically, literature is basically to teach and delight. We mentioned this later on. And then there is, so there is the universe, the, 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 the audience, and then the poet or the author. And this is called the expressive, expressive schools, where poetry is self-expression. This is basically the romantic, romantic uh, literature. So universe, the text and the universe, the text and the audience, its impact on the audience here. Yeah, this is how much, how accurately, how it reflects, how it imitates life, universe. The audience, the relationship between the text and the poet. With the romantics, we said that the poem is, is the poet. And then for the fourth is the text and the text itself. Sometimes called the objective, objective. Now those people, say that the meaning of the text is in the text itself. You analyze the form, the structure, the sounds, the irony, the puns, the paradoxes, and you analyze you know, the binaries, the opposites, that create some kind of tension. And when you try to understand, when you analyze this, when you get to the bottom of it, it gives you the meaning. But other uh, schools said no. This is not like a wisdom tooth lying there to be extracted. The meaning is not there to be extracted. Everybody, everybody can have his or her own reading or interpretation of the text depending on our experience, on our ideology, on our background. And for those people, they believe that there are as many readings of a text as there are readers. Because they believe that everybody tries to see himself or herself in the text we read, to replicate ourselves. You know, you, look, you read the, the text, you see how it relates to you, what it means to you, how it impacts you, and how you understand it in this, in this sense. So, new criticism is, is, is some kind of an objective uh, school where we have uh, structuralism, formalism, and the, I'm not going to talk about in detail about these, but you'll have a course next next term. But this school emphasizes 
the, the, the close reading of the text itself, like we just did, like we do in our course. In my course, I try to do a mixture of things, but I focus on the, the close reading of texts to appreciate the aesthetics, the beauty of the word choice and the word order and, and everything else. Also the structure and the form. So for example, new critics would be looking for devices like the paradox, like the irony, like puns, like ambiguity. If you look at the text, the first thing, and by the way, some, it was a new critic who said uh, that this is not a good poem about Chile's po uh, poem. And this is really surprising. No, th a new critic, I don't know his name. He said uh, Shelley's poem is not a good poem because it's clear the meaning is there. Despite the fact that this poem is filled with irony and even puns and ambiguity and paradoxes, there is irony in the fact that this man is commanding the mighty people to despair, to look at the works and despair. And now we look at the, at the, at the works, I don't know how you would be reacting depending on your experience. We could, ha ha, yeah? Huh. This does not make us despair any longer, although, compare this to the past, to when this king was alive, and this is a very significant question in literature, how meanings change because time changes, because people change, because sometimes the place changes. And this is not only because he's dead. Look at some Arab countries here. In, in Arab countries, the, the president would die, and 40, 50 years later, you still can not mock his picture. Because the regime still lives. The big brother is watching you. But here, and I like what the man, what Chile is doing this to the, the symbol, the, the icons of authority. He's bringing them down. He's mocking them. He's like, you know, the, the, the Bart Simpson moment, ha ha, or what's, what's, how does he do that laugh? It's like this. Okay? So there is irony. You could, some people would, uh, uh, would say that the word mock probably has two meanings. Even the word lies. The face lies. The visage, the visage lies. Like yes. it's not telling the truth. Yes, it's like it just lies there. The it could be a pun. Even the word mock. Mock means to imitate, to imitate or, or to make fun of, to ridicule. The hand that mocked, like in a way, this text, this sculpture is now, in the past probably, it was exalting the king. It was presenting him as the most, you know, powerful king of all. But later on, a thousand years later, it's now mocking him. Because that's the, the art itself outlives. And this itself creates ambiguity. What does the poet, what does this mean? We don't know. We're not sure. It's, it doesn't mean we don't know at all. We're not sure, like, is it this one or that one? Creating an, uh, an ambiguous thing, a reading that is challenging. We, it's not easy to decide. And you find the paradox here, the same thing here, that could be paradoxical. I think the reading itself. Also, that the poem itself, if we understand it directly, then we can't apply it directly on one thing. Like we can apply this poem in these days, like in the, in the regimes, in the other regimes, in Egypt, like they are building uh, uh, the, 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 the... No politics, okay. Okay, the presidential palaces, while people... No politics. So, so of, of course it's applicable, of course it's applicable. It's even here in Gaza, it doesn't, you don't have to go to other countries. Please. I think it's revolutionary. He's trying to tell people that kings uh, nowadays, in the days that he wrote the poem, they are after hundred of years they are going to be dead and nothing will remain of them. So just don't do something. Like or he's telling us even when he was mighty and powerful and challenging, even the kings, the sculptor was mocking him. It was the artist who was mocking him, making fun of him, and probably he's promoting the idea that poets have to be there for people, not like teachers telling you don't get into politics, but like. Uh, uh, promoting you to, to rebel, to rise, to be like this sculptor, to bring this man down, to mock him. I think the moral is really clear. Don't be too proud, nothing remains. 
That's very simplistic, sorry. Sorry to say this. But if you take it this way, this explains what the man said about the poem. It's very clear, it's out there. But there is a lot to unravel. If you take this as a simple poem, a straightforward poem, that's not a good reading, in my opinion. Unless you agree with that guy who says that meaning of the poem is very, is very, is very clear. Now, what would Edward Said say? If the reader is different, say Edward Said, and post-colonialism, again, remember, post-colonialism focuses on the West's construction of the other, about imperialism, about Orientalism, how the West, listen, in brief, Western literature has always been used as a tool of imperialism. How? Number one, it depicts uh, the others, us, Africa, Asia, Middle East, as primitive people who need to be saved, sometimes as exotic people. And it depicts the Western, uh, Westerners as the saviors, as the, the elite owners of the world who have a moral obligation to, come, obligation to come and civilize us. If you again go back and examine the place in the poem, the setting, and how the poem is representing us, look at where the poet is again, the, the traveler is positioning himself. I'm sure, you know, I'm not sure when exactly he had this experience. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that it wasn't this, that good in, in, in the Middle East. But going to the middle of the desert, out there, leaving behind all what the Muslim civilization, the Arab civilization, or even the Egyptian civilization, what they contributed to humanity, to civilization, and just focusing on this particular thing, pre presenting, giving this idea, talking about uh, uh, the, the people of the Middle East, the non-white, non-Europeans, in this sense, mocking them, this, having this hubris, these are people who just live in the past. Because in this sense, yeah, this is a man who lives in the past, a man who lost everything but is still proud. This is probably a miniature of, of what the Arabs are now. I agree in, 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 a, in a sense, in a way. We still, many Arabs still live in the, in the glory of the past. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair, our works that were in the past that we no longer have. But the fact that the traveler is choosing this particular negative and even describing this land as antique, the sand, and how it's lifeless, this is the Middle East. He doesn't give us, the poet doesn't give us a good sonnet form. We don't deserve it, perhaps. So for people like Edward Said, they might take this as, again, an extension to the imperialist, uh, uh, to, to poetry being an imperialist tool. A tool used to uh, uh, look at the, the, the West as the very opposite, the contrast of the East, sorry, as the, uh, look at the Orient as the contrasting image of the West. We are backward, we are shattered, we are half sunk, we are lifeless, we are trunkless, we live in the sand, and that's why this has become an, an archetypal image. Arabs have always been associated, are still being associated with camels and money and oil and sand. And again, going back to the reader response theory that I just mentioned here in, in a bit, those people believe that uh, the meanings of a text rely in a dynamic way on the work of the reader. Objective theories believe that, listen, like for example, you could mention something about the history of, of you know, the context, historical context, context background. Uh, objective theories say they, they could be interesting, but they have little to contribute to understanding the poem. Now those people say, you as a reader, anyone of you can have his or her reading and interpretation of, of the text. Because the meaning is not there to be extracted. The meaning of the text is the relationship between you as a reader and the text itself. So, the question I asked about Ozymandias, however you read it, with a challenging, uh, who, in what sense. They say here, basically, if you, if you 
many people, by the way, some of you remain silent, but many, many, many people would want a strong, powerful leader, even if this leader is a dictator or totalitarian, but someone who could control everything. Somebody who would, you know, like we have, we have this. But some people who look at, like, if the same thing could be from a father figure point of view. Like, I, I'm asking this question, you could think about it. When your father is unfair to you, how would you feel if he's just, you know, I'm not saying that this is our father, but if from a symbolic uh, perspective, it could be. This could be about father-son relationship, the fathers and sons. So it says here, if basically, basically, if you, if you respect your dad, your granddad, your grandparents, you look up to them, you consider them to be great people despite their shortcomings, you know, you might feel a little bit sympathetic to, towards Ozymandias. If you hate dictators, no matter what, if you hate these father figures, people who want to impose their opinions and their world views, their ideas on you, you could, you could hate Ozymandias very much. And you could have different opinions, you know, it's, it's just a, a rainbow of, of opinions. So what do you think? Think about this when you go, when you go home. I asked two questions here before we finish. Does the reading of texts change over time? Do we have a fixed meaning of every text? Is there a fixed reading? Do texts have just one meaning each? I just, like, you know, I'm using this text to show you that we basically don't. You will, you yourself, try to do this. If you change places, if you change, if you become a mother or a wife or a teacher, like many things change about how you see things. If you travel, I want when you travel, hopefully, when you travel to another different place, try to read the texts you read when you were here. I, I, the first thing I felt is I was reading I, I write to Ramallah in Gaza. I saw Ramallah by Murid Barghouti a hundred years ago and I was like, oh, this is perfect. And when I traveled to London, I, I, I took this, the book with me because I loved it very much. I started reading it and I was like, I was crying. I was like, what? What happened to me? What's wrong with me? And then, because I'm the same person. It's just been six months. But I'm totally different here because the place is different. I'm far away from my homeland, from Palestine, from my family, from my kids, from my students, from the people I like. So everything was totally different. So even when you change place or something could happen to you. Uh, finally, uh, what are the romantic features? I'm counting here four that I am interested in. And you could look for more. Number one, experimenting on the form of the poem. And this is connected with number four, actually. How the form is the content and the content is the form. They are inseparable. So he's depicting a world that is formless, trunkless, lifeless. And he gives, he uses a, a sonnet that is formless and structureless. Wow. So the form is no longer a given. The meaning is significant. The meaning makes the form flexible. This thing about, but basically this is about the second generation. When you read Keats, when you read Byron, oh, when you read Byron, when you read uh, Shelley, they openly call for rebellion, for revolution, like an actual rebellion. They are many, they, uh, you are many, they are few. Like cries, like lions after slumber. Rise, rise, rebel. Get them. This is Shelley, inviting us to rise. There is nature there in, in, in a way, probably different from the nature we've seen in, uh, so what's what?
possibly, but he could be losing this symbolically. I have this idea before that this whole poem could be about the authority of Wordsworth and Coleridge. He's trying, you know, to topple them down. Like, go away, Wordsworth. Go away, Coleridge. Can be taken in, in so many ways. That's a good question, yeah, yeah. That's why they describe the second generation of romantic poets, the younger generation. But usually young people are revolutionary, so in a sense. But many people believe that the essence of romanticism is a rejection of you know, the mainstream, whether it is poetry or politics. If you take romanticism in this sense as a rejection of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, this is romantic. It's romanticism is a revolution. Finally, I don't think it's a criticism of certain society. It's a criticism of the idea of authoritarianism itself. No matter what the country is, no matter what the society is, it's still a criticism of authoritarianism. Yeah, possibly. I take it. I take this. I think this is valid also. But again, because in England there was poverty. If you are the mightiest country, the most powerful country, the empire on which the sun never set should have enriched the people there. That's why he said this is a society where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I'll, uh, I'll be posting on Facebook, posting pictures of uh, a sculpture of Ramses they found. Uh, two years ago. I wrote a parody, I'll post it also there, and I'm encouraging you to write parodies of this uh, sonnet in the form of sonnet. Give it a try. Okay, thank you very much. Stay behind if you have a question. Good luck and see you soon.